Most APS-C Sony cameras come in the kit with the 16 to 50 f3.5 5.6 kit lens. But what if you want to upgrade it to Sigma 17 to 40 f1.8, which is 10 times more expensive and 5 times bigger and heavier? So let's see. What's good, guys? Now let's compare it in terms of the size and weight. The Sigma is 560 grams compared to the kit lens, which is 107 grams only, so five times less heavy. And also the 16 to 50 kit lens is looking like a toy on your camera, no matter it extends a little bit when you turn on the camera, but compared to Sigma with the lens hood, it's simply super tiny. In terms of the full frame equivalent focal length, we get 25.5 to 60 millimeters on the Sigma and 24 to 75 millimeters on the Sony. And this this is how it looks in the real world. The difference on the wide end is not huge, but on the telephoto end the 50mm is looking a bit more preferable. But the difference in light transmission or the aperture is huge. f1.8 is a lot brighter and you need to keep in mind that the kit lens has variable aperture, so it is 3.5 at the wide end, but as soon as you zoom in to at least 35mm it becomes a 5.6. And here you can see the exactly the same settings in terms of the shutter speed and ISO, but the aperture is different f1.8 versus 5.6 and it's night and day difference, literally. Now let's have a look at the sharpness, we're shooting at the widest end, 24 megapixels, raw, no lens corrections, 500% scale, shot on the Sony FX30, and as you can tell guys, straight from f1.8, the Sigma is a lot sharper than the Sony lens. If we step down to f2.8, it's even more sharp, if we step down both lenses to f4, Sony gets a slight boost in sharpness, and by f5.6 we get the best sharpness of the Sony lens, but still it is less sharp than the Sigma. Then let's have a look in the corners, and here we can see that the Sigma is sharper, wide open f1.8 than the Sony lens, and when we step down to f2.8, f4, and especially f5.6, the Sigma is rocking here. The Sony isn't great even at f5.6. Now we're zoomed in at 35mm on both lenses and still wide open at f1.8, the Sigma is a lot sharper. When we step down to f2.8 it gets even more sharp, stepping down to f4 and finally stopping down to f5.6 and the Sony kit lens is already at f5.6 because it is stopped down by default at 35mm to f5.6 and it is still less contrasty and less sharp than the Sigma lens. But in the corners it's a bit different story because at 35mm Sigma isn't the sharpest lens in the corner and we need to step down to at least f4 to get similar to Sony results and then we step down to f5.6 and finally we get a better sharpness in the corner. And finally we have zoomed in to 40mm on the Sigma and 50mm on the kit lens and as you can tell guys it is nowhere near as sharp at 50mm even though it's f5.6 on the Sony kit lens and then the Sigma is simply destroying it at all the aperture values and especially at f5.6. And now in the corners the Sigma is looking a lot sharper, it's much sharper than the Sony lens and when you step down to at least f4, 5.6 you get great sharpness with the Sigma lens and still pretty poor with the Sony. It means guys that in terms of the resolution and sharpness you get much better results with the Sigma lens at all focal length and aperture values. Starting from f1.8 wide open it is sharper than this lens at f5.6. Now we're taking a look at the distortion and vignette. Both lenses have barrel distortion but the Sony has much stronger barrel distortion as well as the very dark corners, almost black corners in the extreme corner of the shot. And as you can tell guys you need to keep the in-camera corrections on with the kit lens or apply the profile in Lightroom when you edit the raw photos. And also guys when you stop down the situation gets much better on the Sigma by f2.8 by f4 it's getting better on both and by f5.6 you almost get rid of the black corners on the Sony lens and the Sigma is looking really nice. And now we're zoomed in to telephoto distance, 40mm on Sigma and 50mm on the Sony and as you can tell guys we have a pincushion distortion right now and it is stronger on the Sigma this time but also if you stop down to f2.8 and especially f4 we get pretty nice results and by f5.6 the results are really great. In terms of the minimum focus and distance on the widest end, the Sigma can focus more closely and also guys I suggest stopping down your lens when you do have the minimal focus and distance to get the best image quality. And then we have the telephoto end, Sigma is really not that much closer than the Sony and you get also better image quality when you stop down to at least f4 on the Sigma, but the Sony is not showing great results in terms of the sharpness. Here we have the chromatic aberrations test, the longitudinal chromatic aberrations or LOCA and on the Sony we have 35mm f5.6 
no chromatic aberrations, but still the contrast is really, really low. On the Sigma, we have much better contrast, but still we have a lot of chromatic aberrations. We need to stop down to F2A to make them appear not as extreme. Then we have F4 and pretty good results. And by F5.6, we get the best results, almost no chromatic aberrations. And now we're testing the autofocus performance at 35mm f5.6 on the kit lens. We're using the Sony ZV E10 Mark II with the latest and greatest AI autofocus. The autofocus speed and sensitivity are set to the maximum and the video is slowed down to 50% so you can better see the performance of the autofocus. And in my opinion, the Sony kit lens does a great job in terms of the autofocus. I don't see any pulsation or missing focus with it. It's a great lens for focusing because it's really easy to focus at f5.6 to be honest. Now we're taking a look at the Sigma 17 to 40 at 35 millimeters f1.8, the same settings, same camera, and it's doing a really good job at focusing to the background. It's focusing just instantly, but when I get back into the shot, we have a very slight pulsation. You wouldn't notice it if it was played in the real time, but at 50% speed, I can see a very slight double checking of the lens. It tries to go a bit further, then a bit back, and kind of double checks the image and then focuses. It's nothing too crazy, not too bad, really good results as well. So I would give an A plus for both lenses for the autofocus. And here you can see them both side by side. Also guys, 16 to 50 millimeters has a power zoom capability, so you have a zoom rocker and it zooms in with the motor, it's kind of digitally, let me say, you don't zoom in with your actually fingers. And also while zooming in, you don't lose autofocus a ton, so the motor of the autofocus keeps up with it really, really well. Uh, with the Sigma lens, you have to zoom in manually, of course, and if you do it in a very fast fashion, you can lose autofocus just for a split second, let me say. So be gentle, don't zoom in like crazy, do a gentle zoom in, and you'll have no issues with the crash zoom autofocusing. In terms of focus breathing effect, the Sony 16 to 50 has a very slight focus breathing effect at 16 millimeters, and then at 50 millimeters, it is a bit more noticeable. But on the Sony lens, you can enable the focus breathing compensation and get rid of it completely. On the Sigma at 17 millimeters, you do get a very slight focus breathing effect, but it's not really dramatic and you wouldn't notice it in the real life. And at 40 millimeters, it almost doesn't have focus breathing effect whatsoever. It's a very nice result for video work. And for the next test, I did my best ninja walk, guys. Here you can see the Sony 16 to 50 on my Sony ZV E10 Mark II. This camera has no IBIS, so right now we are set to steady shot standard. It means that we are only using the OSS or in lens stabilization optical steady shot. And as you can tell, we don't have super nice results. But if we compare it with the Sigma, with the stabilization turned off completely, it's just a disaster. So at least it is better to have some level of stabilization in the lens than not have it at all. But also in Sony ZV-10 Mark II, we can enable the steady shot active, which crops the image by 1.33x, 33% basically, and you can get really nice results. But guys, keep in mind that you have to use very short shutter speeds, at least 1 over 250th of a second, not to get the artifacts of the digital stabilization, so it's not the best solution. And also I was shooting at 35 millimeters previously, and right now I have to go to 24 millimeters because of a huge crop. And here you can see all three images side by side, only OSS in the Sony lens, then no stabilization whatsoever with the Sigma, and then with the Sigma and the digital crop, 33%. It looks pretty stable, but guys, keep in mind that you have to have very short shutter speed and you lose the wide end as well, so it's not perfect. And then we're checking it out on the Sony FX30, which has IBIS, and now we're combining in steady shot standard the OSS in the lens and the IBIS in the camera in body image stabilization. And the results are not great, but still it is better than not having the uh, image stabilization in the lens itself. 
Now we're taking a look at the Sigma 17 to 40, also at 35 millimeters with the steady shot standard. So only the IBIS is working right now. And as you can tell, the image is much more jerky and not that stable. So the Sony in this regard wins. And as you know, guys, the Sony native lenses have like 20 to 25% better image stabilization with Sony Bites and IBIS. And here you can see those side by side. And you can definitely say that the Sigma is more shaky than the Sony 16 to 50 with OSS, even in standard steady shot mode. But I can highly recommend you guys using the active steady shot on your Sony FX30 or A6700 because it gives you much better results. So here you can see the steady shot active 1.1x crop plus OSS in the lens and this footage is more than okay. I can slightly stabilize it in post and get gimbal like footage from this type of setup. And here is the Sigma 17 to 40 at 35 millimeters and steady shot active. You can see much more jerky movements and pretty big jumps in the image. That is why the third party lenses is not the best choice for handheld video work or you should use something like a tripod, monopod or a gimbal. And here side by side you can see the difference really clearly. So in this regard, if you are going from the 16 to 50 OSS lens to something like Sigma 17 to 40, you do lose a little bit of quality in terms of stabilization. With your sony camera in terms of the flares performance i can definitely say that both lenses are doing pretty much good job i don't see a major loss of contrast or any other issues with working with lights directly in the shot so i can say that both lenses the sigma and the sony have nice results they do have very slight artifacts when the light is exactly in the frame at a certain angle and the flare on the 16 to 50 is a bit more saturated than i want it to be but all in all the results are great the same goes for the telephoto and I would say that both lenses are doing fine. The Sony kit lens might be having some issues with contrast when the light is directly in the shot, but all in all it's a pretty good result. And now guys we're looking at the bokeh quality and this is what you get at 16 millimeters f3.5 with the kit lens some background separation was there but it's nowhere near as blurry as with the sigma at 17 millimeters and f1.8 it has a lot of bokeh and background separation here we have it side by side and guys basically this is the difference between like shot on an iphone <laughs> and shot on a real camera i'm just kidding but you get the point here we have the 35mm f5.6 on the kit lens and also the 35mm f1.8 on the Sigma. The difference is night and day basically. When we compare those two side by side, you can also tell a huge difference and I really like how the bokeh kind of swirls on the Sigma. It reminds me of a Helios type of lens in the corners of the image. And at 50mm f5.6 we do get some background separation with the kit lens but it's nowhere near as uh, blurry and nicely looking as on the Sigma at 40mm f1.8. As you can tell from this comparison, it's a very big difference, guys. And here is the difference in the bokeh quality. And as you can tell, we have also a huge difference in terms of the light transmission. f1.8 is a lot brighter than f5.6 at 35mm. And when you stop down to f8, you still retain the circular shapes of the bokeh balls on the Sigma, which is also a very nice addition. And here you can see that the bokeh is kind of swirling, it has cat's eye shape on the Sigma and I really like this effect, it adds a lot of character to the shots and all in all the bokeh quality on the Sigma is great. And here you have the coma smearing effect, it is existent on the Sigma and it gets completely eliminated by f2.8 and now we're stopping down to f8 to see the sun stars and the sun stars are looking really nice on the Sigma and at f16 we do have some stars as well on the kit lens but still they are much more pleasing on the Sigma lens. And also guys, I have to mention that on the Sigma lens we have a lot of customizable buttons and functions. So we have two customizable buttons as well as the AFMF switch and also the aperture ring which can be clicked or declicked which is a very nice touch and you can also lock the aperture ring in the A mode. So you can use this lens with the aperture ring and then set your shutter speed and ISO with two wheels or your budget Sony camera. And on the kit lens we only have the zoom rocker which is a nice touch and the focusing ring. And also the lens mount is made out of plastic, you need to keep this in mind. And finally guys about the pricing, the kit lens is $100 when you purchase it together with your camera, but separately it is $320. And I do not recommend buying this lens for $320, obviously. And this lens is $920, not cheap by any means, but it's definitely worth every penny in my opinion. So guys, I hope you did enjoy this video and now you understand why you need to go 
from here to here, from your kit lens to something bigger and better. And if you think that this lens is too big and expensive and you want to see something else, I have a full review and comparison of six different zoom lenses for Sony APS-Cs and you can watch it right here up next. If you did enjoy this video, smash the like and subscribe buttons and hit the notifications bell and I see you right there guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care.